Well, good morning everybody and warmly welcome to this Baltic breakfast, the last one before the summer, summer holidays. My name is Gunn Rydqvist and uh, I work at Stockholm University Baltic Sea Centre, who are the organisers of this event. And today we're going to talk about increased consumption of seafood from a sustainability perspective. But just a few words about the Baltic Sea Centre. We are, as you know, a part of Stockholm University. And at the university there are at least 300 marine researchers, so we are just a centre that focus on communication and research. And the centre, the focus area for our work is of course the big challenges for the Baltic Sea. And we deal with issues that are on land, in the coastal area and in the open sea. And we do this by actually having three main ways of operating. We have a, a fantastic infrastructure with a research vessel called Electra and a field station at Aske. And we of course have a number of researchers also situated at the Baltic Sea Centre. But we also focus a lot on communication and policy issues. And these Baltic breakfasts, these are part of our work with outreach. So that's about that. Um, you can put questions to us during today's topic. You can do that either by Twitter or sending an email to ostersjocentrum.su.eu and uh, the address will probably be at the bottom of your screen. And please also use Slido and the code is 22102. So let's get started with today's topic. Increased consumption of seafood from a sustainability perspective. Well, seafood, you know, food from lakes, rivers uh, and the sea, of course, is becoming a larger part of the debate on food security. Uh, we know that the UN Food Summit, uh, with its pre-meeting soon and then the larger meeting in September, will be talking about this, of course. And we also know that the Conference on the Future of Europe has also brought this on the agenda, and that's organised by the European Commission. And the Commission has stressed seafood in a number of different strategies. You, for instance, the farm to fork strategy as part of the Green Deal. And for those of you who are interested in different consultations, there is right now an open consultation on algae production out on the Commission website that you can go and comment on algae production. But it's not only pushed seafood as part of food security, but of course also as part of rural development, job opportunities, etc. And science has been studying seafood from different perspectives, of course, and uh, today we will dig into what science can tell you about sustainability issues and then continue with discussing consumer aspects. Are the consumers interested? How do you get them interested? Is it about nudging or is it about general information or what, what can we do and what kind of science has there been on consumer behaviorism? And we have two excellent researchers with us to help us with this. We have Sara Hunborg, who is a PhD in natural science at the researcher at, with sustainable consumption and production at RISE, the research institutes of Sweden. And Sara, give us a wave so we know who you are. Yes. And then we have Marlene Jonell, who is a PhD in system ecology and a researcher at both the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences and Stockholm Resilience Centre here at Stockholm University. Welcome, both of you. And I will start by giving the floor to Sara, who will tell you a bit more about sustainability issues of seafood. Please, Sara. Thank you very much. And I'll start with share my screen. So do you see my screen now? Yes, excellent. Perfect. So uh, I will then talk today about seafood from a sustainability perspective. And as you're probably all aware of, this is a really big question, but I'll do my best to provide some perspective in this uh, short time of uh, my talk. 
And I'd like to start with a general point of departure for this talk related to seafood that I'd like you to remember and that I spend this talk explaining a bit and nuancing. And that is that seafood is a highly diverse, but generally a low carbon and nutritious food uh, alternative co compared to uh, other uh, animal based options. Uh, of course, this starting point comes with many follow up questions and I'll take one of the uh, if we take one of the questions that this breakfast seminar was promoted uh, with was will increased seafood consumption benefit food sustainability and marine ecosystems. And for this question, the scientific answer is, as perhaps always, uh, not surprisingly, it depends. It depends on what you replace. If you eat more seafood and at the cost of animal, land-based animal production or vegetables. It depends on if what impacts you compare. If you compare carbon footprints or biodiversity or, or other uh, aspects of food produ production. It also highly depends on which seafood that you choose when you increase your uh, consumption because uh, they vary a lot in terms of uh, pressures and nutritional uh, value. And it also brings you to the question of where will it actually come from? Uh, and uh, uh, because an increase would need to be uh, produced somewhere and increase in, in some way. And uh, this gives us, um, an, um, just as an example then, the, if we take Swedish seafood consumption as a baseline, uh, our, we are recommended to increase our consumption compared to current. We barely uh, reach up to it two times a week compared to two, three times a week. And meanwhile, there is a lack in domestic supply of uh, seafood resources. And that is a common uh, um, issue uh, around Europe. There was a recent paper looking at that less than half of the dietary recommendations related to seafood in Europe are actually met by national supplies. This gives you a high dependence of imports, as uh, is also seen in Sweden, about 75% uh, of the volume is imported. And uh, uh, the Swedish production uh, comes from fisheries in at about 20% and aquaculture 6%. So aquaculture is really a, a marginal business in Sweden today. And that is the sector that has been talked much, uh, uh, much about that has the potential to grow. So if we were to increase our uh, consumption in Sweden, it needs to either come from more imports, uh, an increase in aquaculture, given that fisheries are constrained, and or use more of the less utilized resources. And that could be species of less consumer interest today, such as carp fishes in the Baltic, or eat more parts of the fish. And we have a focus on fillets. Uh, so there is more to fish uh, than the fillet. So uh, uh, at this point, we perhaps need to pay attention to what seafood we should eat and how to sustainably be able to produce more. And this brings us to the second question uh, related to the seminar. What can science tell us about environmental impacts? And this is an example of a carbon footprint study of uh, Norwegian seafood and how they relate to uh, land-based animal production, the red bars. And as you can see here, uh, the carbon footprint varies a lot between different uh, seafoods, and some are very low compared to animal-based foods, while others are a bit higher and, and comparable. And if you would say add uh, a carrot or, or a vegetable to this graph, you would find that uh, a seafood such as herring would be comparable in terms of carbon footprint. But uh, the other aspect of seafood is that it's also a highly nutrition, uh, nutritional uh, re, uh, food. So if we, uh, uh, seafood has many values beyond proteins. And in Sweden, we're not promoted in the dietary advice uh, to eat more seafood because we need more proteins. We don't need more mm -hmm. proteins. It's, it's the other uh, aspects of seafood uh, for health and, uh, that are uh, um, being promoted. And if you then would look at the add another layer of sustainability, the nutritional value, uh, you could, uh, together with the carbon footprint, you can get a picture uh, looking like this, where you would find that in the, the green corner of this graph, you would find uh, species that have a very high nutritional uh, density like, um, value, and also a low carbon footprint. And those are like small pelagic fish, such as sprat and, and herring. 
for instance. And up in the red part of this graph, you would find those would have, that has a lower nutritional value and also a higher uh, environment uh, climate uh, footprint. And you can also find uh, some examples of where uh, a beef, where beef and pig and, uh, and, and chicken uh, would, how that seafood would relate to that. So in this way, you can get, uh, you can capture how the, the varied uh, nutritional content varies between different seafoods and the climate in, uh, and the climate impact, and then try to direct your choices towards the, the best options uh, and try to improve the ones that need <laughs> improvement. Uh, so seafood is not seafood, it's a huge variability, and it can really play any role in carbon footprints and nutrition of diets. Okay, but there are also other environmental aspects of seafood production and all kinds of food productions, and uh, some are common to systems that are often quantified in these life cycle assessments, and that are greenhouse gas emissions, eutrophication, and energy consumption. But then, of course, seafood has some unique pressures that are associated with different products or systems. And it's really, uh, this is arguably where research is now, how to suitably address and assess different pressures, press, pressures and challenges between different food systems in a useful and comprehensive way. And it may also, in the debate today, boil down to a discussion on a half full or a half uh, empty glass, because there are certainly good and bad options here. Uh, but no food comes uh, without impact, so it's rather how to define and set what are characterizes sustainable uh, limits to impacts. And when we talk about the sustainable increase in, in aquaculture, it's also important to address the increased dependence on land here illustrated by the development of uh, feeds for Norwegian uh, salmon. This increases the competition of limited land resources and may also come with other trade-offs such as increased greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, there is also a shift away from these marine ecosystems that the question was posed, is it lessen the marine ecosystem impacts towards terrestrial, terrestrial ecosystems, and they also have linkages uh, to, 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 to the marine environment as well. So perhaps you could think about, re it's about replacing. Uh, if we have limited feed resources uh, and land resources, really important that we direct them towards efficient feed converters, such as fish. But either being fished or farmed, a uh, functioning food system rely requires reliable access to a su sustainably produced resources and, and value chains start with management. And it's really of increasing emergency to really safeguard food security because it's been found that food production shocks, that is sudden production losses, are increasing globally. And proactive management, either for a farm or fishery, is crucial since losses are often related to poor management. For aquaculture production, that was found extra sensitive. It was often related to, say, disease outbreaks, whereas for capture fisheries, they're mainly subjected to mismanagement related to collapse of fish stocks, for instance. So, for, and furthermore, if crops are failing, uh, the feed dependent systems are at risk too. So the systems are, of course, highly, highly connected. And in the next step is also about the whole value chain and really focus on how to minimize food losses along the whole value chain. Um, because optimizing output uh, makes uh, uh, the product come with less pressures uh, per unit of, of product. And if you zoom in from this global perspective down to, to the Baltic, uh, there are both challenges and opportunities related uh, to, to seafood consumption and production. Uh, consumer habits pose a challenge because we're focused on a few species and have, uh, just a limited part of the actual resource, such, such as the fillet, when there is much more uh, resource that could be used uh, than the fillet. Uh, there is also these uh, uh, opportunities for production in the Baltic. We have uh, problems with uh, a lot of coastal fisheries in terms of fish resources, and also aquaculture conditions are not uh, op optimal in the Baltic due to the eutrophication. So we need to find ways on how, how we could uh, increase uh, aquaculture if we want to uh, increase uh, seafood production here. 
Uh, another challenge is, of course, the dietary advice, where there is some species and areas are associated with harmful sub substances. And uh, in particular, the debate about the, the, the herring in the Baltic that really has a low heart carbon footprint and high nutritional value, but then may have then these harmful substances. Can, how, to, how to deal with that? But the dietary advice also offers opportunities because we are recommended to increase our uh, seafood consumption. So it's really how to, how to work uh, to co-create solutions here. And there are also, if the production is constrained, there are many tasks beyond production. Uh, it's really about improving the utilization of the available resources to see, to, to uh, optimize uh, the volumes that are turned direct to, to human uh, consumption. And this also then, of course, uh, requires to create consumer interest in these uh, less utilized parts of the fish and also species, such as uh, carp fishes that have been on the agenda uh, quite recently. So to summarize, will increased seafood consumption benefit sustainability and marine ecosystems? Well, I guess this depends then. It depends on what seafood you eat and how it is produced. What can science tell us about environmental impacts? And of course, seafood is not seafood, but it has a general low carbon footprint compared to other animal-based foods. There are, of course, environmental trade-offs and unique challenges to seafood, and it, re it really calls for a proactive management uh, to, to allow for sustainable development. And it's crucial that changes occur in both consumption and production today. And with that, I would like to finalize this talk with just saying that we produced some policy briefs in, in Swedish uh, within the SeaWind project. So if you're interested in more details concerning the Swedish uh, consumption of seafood, you can have a look at that web page. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sara. Very interesting. Uh, um, you highlighted yourself when we looked at that interesting graph with nutritional values and carbon footprint, that diagram with all the lovely colors and the fish and the species spread out. You highlighted that that only took into aspect the carbon issues, you know, the, the climate issues. So has there been any research on, as you mentioned later, then adding on other different environmental aspects? Would that shift the different species around a lot? It would be interesting to do that in that same graph format, because a life cycle assessment, of course, takes into account other aspects such as eutrophication. Uh, so that could be uh, one way. But also the more layers and axes you use, the, the more difficult it, it becomes for the consumer. And I guess uh, that's something that Martin can talk about, how to really access to simple messages and how to... Um, it's a complex world, uh, but of course... Yeah, that's perfect. We'll go on to the consumer aspects. <laughs> uh, we have one question, a sort, sort of short follow-up question also, uh, regarding is it possible to describe relations between sustainable but toxic seafood production? Is that You mentioned it and you stressed the fact that there are problems with, especially for instance in the Baltic Sea. Is that done? Is that looked into more in detail? We would like to look more at that, uh, actually, because I think it is an important uh, issue, especially if you work with the Baltic. And um, I'd say that there, there, sh there should be a lot of different uh, opportunities to, say, remove the toxins from, from the, the herring, because that is done when they use it for feed. But then you don't get a fillet, you get like a, a, some kind of a substance that you need to transform in a, in, a, in, a, in a product that the consumers are interested in. But it could be protein uh, protein powder or something like that so there are opportunities to, to work with that um, if, if you talk about from a human perspective um, the toxins okay yeah so we'll get back to more questions during the last 50 minutes of discussion so thank you so yeah. far Sara very interesting and we will move on to Marlin Yonell and we will hear more about the different aspects of consumer parts of this seafood please Marlin, now share your screen. Okay, now I think you can probably. Yeah, can you can you see this? Yes, wonderful. Thank you. you. Can you hear me? Yes, that's perfect. Okay, thank you so much. So, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Marlin Jonell. I'm a researcher at the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences and the Stockholm Resilience Center, and I'm here to talk about the consumption side when it comes to sustainable seafood. 
And um, now let's see. Um, one week from now, the Swedish part of the audience will look at something like this. So one week from now, we have Swedish Midsummer, and this figure illustrates a typical plate with pickled herring. And of course, seafood is a, an important part of the Nordic diet, and particularly so in the big holidays such as Midsummer, but also throughout the year. But being a conscious seafood consumer is not easy. We are bombarded by messages around health, sustainability, food safety, et cetera. So how to make the best choice and how to steer consumption. So my presentation today will focus on how much and what should we eat, a bit overlapping with Sarah, but still some new elements. Uh, focusing on the consumer and how to stimulate change from the perspective of the individual consumer, uh, but finally zooming out a bit to look at what are effective mechanisms to shift consumption towards uh, more sustainable practices. And my focus will be the Swedish market primarily, a little bit zooming out on the global situation and a few examples from Baltic states, um, but still the, the focus in Sweden. And also uh, when I say seafood, I mean seafood produced in both marine and freshwater environments, both aquaculture and fisheries, primarily animals and less so algae. Uh, so this figure again illustrates what we eat in Sweden, and as mentioned by Sarah, not very diverse. Uh, the most popular one is farmed salmon from Norway. We import more than 70% of what we have on our plates. Uh, but how much should we eat then? Uh, well, the Eat Lancet report that was launched in early 2019 had the main objective to assess whether we can feed 10 billion people a healthy diet within food planetary boundaries. And this report stated that seafood will be very important for feeding a growing world population. And they also provided a recommendation uh, from a health perspective of eating 28 grams of seafood per day. And that is slightly less than what is recommended by the Swedish uh, Food Authority and the Nordic recommendations. But the Atlanta Commission also provided a quite generous span of up to 100 grams per day. That is also like safe and beneficial from a health perspective. So you can probably not eat too much, but the question is how much do we, do we need? This figure illustrates the global perspective of how far we are from eating in accordance to the Eat Lancet diet for seafood intake. And the orange bar there represents the global consumption of seafood. And that's quite close to what is recommended by the Land Lancet Commission. In Sweden, we eat a little bit more, but still very in line with, with the recommendations. So in accordance to this, we are eating enough and uh, a good amount of seafood. But in other parts of the world, uh, particularly South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, consumption can be substantially increased to boost uh, the nutrition of, of people. And today around 840 million people are dependent on seafood for their daily intake of proteins and, and micro and macronutrients. So for them, it's really, really key. And for us, sweets is not actually that important, but it cannot be important from the perspective of helping us to shift away from more impactful and less healthy red meat, for instance. So what is important for the consumer when buying seafood? So this slide is borrowed from the Marine Stewardship Council and their globe scan survey involving 1000 Swedish consumers in 2020. And this is a global study. So if you're interested in other countries or the global perspective, please visit the MSC website. So what this shows is that characteristics, including taste, safety, health, and freshness are more important than sustainability. Sustainability is ranking quite high. Uh, certification you could see further down in the list. So in, to conclude, consumers care about sustainability, but other things are more important. And therefore, we can probably not rely on the individual consumers for shifting seafood consumption to sustainability. But I would also like to stress the importance of individual consumers in the audience to ask difficult questions when in your local grocery store or uh, visiting a restaurant, because what you ask will help the big and important actors to, to provide the information that we need and also push them to better understand where seafood comes from. So I believe that can make a difference. But what can be effective then? 
So this figure illustrates three groups of actors that I will focus the rest of my presentation on. Consumers first, uh, but also retailers and restaurants being powerful and important actors. Others, including nation states and civil society, can of course also be very important uh, through taxes and subsidies, for instance, but will not be included here. In terms of mechanisms, we have certification and seafood recommendation lists as being important for all three actor groups. Recommendation lists uh, can be used by all three of them, but I, to my personal opinion, can be a bit complicated for the individual consumer to understand and to grasp. So maybe a simplification there could be useful and also expanding to more environmental dimensions, for instance, climate. Uh, but the rest of my presentation, I will focus on certification, nudging and choice restrictions or limited supply as a mechanism. So starting with certification, in Sweden, around 30% or a little bit less of all seafood sold is certified by ASC or MSC. And globally, this is a big figure. We see globally, we have around 6% of all seafood produced through aquaculture and fisheries are certified. In Sweden, most of the certified portion is frozen whitefish and a smaller portion uh, is salmon. So that's a smaller one. Well, how can we, how can we make sure that certification is effective when it comes to reducing negative environmental impacts? Well, first of all, we can start looking at what is covered in certification standards in terms of impacts. And this figure illustrates uh, the dimensions covered by uh, capture fisheries and, cert and certified aquaculture standards. And one message here is that most key environmental dimensions are covered to some extent. Some are more difficult to assess and to have an impact on, and that includes negative ecosystem uh, impacts, for instance. Climate impacts are not included in any standard. Uh, there are a few examples of exceptions, including the Swedish krav, but in general not. And social impacts are only uh, partially covered by aquaculture and increasingly so also by the capture fishery standards, but continuous improvements of these standards is important to guarantee effects. Another characteristic of importance is the level of additionality. And with that, I mean the extent to which certification standards, so the rules um, are adding something to what is already required by the national law or regulation in the country. So in this study, we compared uh, the AEC standard with the rules and regulations from the biggest salmon producing countries in the world. And one key result was that we saw uh, that AEC is adding quite a lot to, to the Chilean salmon production, but less so for the Norwegian one where the regulation is already quite strict and where AEC is adding much less. Uh, and finally over to nudging and choice restrictions. So nudging is a way for um, to push citizens or consumers to, uh, to more beneficial behaviors, either from a societal perspective or for the personal individual through health benefits, without taking away the ability to choose what is less beneficial for you. So in a food environment, that can mean uh, having footsteps on the floor or placing foods at the eye level. So, but there are several knowledge gaps when it comes to effectiveness. First, in the, in the bigger area of food and environmental impact, but also what are, how nudging efforts can be scaled up and also what are long-term effects of nudging? Do, will a consumer change his or her behavior permanently or just uh, very shortly when being nudged? Uh, but on the positive side, there is a high acceptance for nudging and uh, it can be implemented often at, at a quite low cost. Choice restrictions are more invasive ways for actors to reduce the number of choices. For instance, uh, in Swedish retail today, we have actors that are not selling imported um, fresh red meat or non-organic bananas. And many of us remember that um, tropical shrimp was not possible to find in Swedish retail for a good while before certification can, came in. And these, this is likely effective, but also quite challenging to implement if we don't have pre-competitive um, collaboration within the retail environment, because the retailers are afraid of consumers going elsewhere if 
they are implementing choice restrictions, but somebody also needs to take the first step. So this can be used more. So finally, some recommendations, improve and develop eco-certification schemes. Explore how nudging can be used more either to, to help consumers away from red meat or to shift to more sustainable seafood. And finally, dare to choose choice editing that is an effective and, and interesting tool for many actors. And my final slide, I would like to highlight some exciting knowledge gaps from the research community. First, uh, linking to what Sarah said in her presentation, how to stimulate consumers to diversify, to choose new species. In Sweden, we eat a handful and the Japanese market, we can find three to 400 species available for consumers. So how can we eat a larger variety? And in the, in the photos here, you can see Sprat that is consumed much more in other Baltic states in comparison to Sweden and uh, a bream, minced bream hamburger a product coming from um, the cod, uh, the pike perch fishery and has been developed as a, as, a, as a product for restaurants, but also for school meals and a way to, to um, say, uh, make it easier for consumers to choose less impactful species and new species. We also need to know more about the role of seafood for shifting away from red meat and investigate if blue food or seafood can be a bridge to more sustainable and healthy eating. We need to know more about the effectiveness of eco-certification, particularly on the landscape and ecosystem level. And finally, also explore what are alternatives to certification, because a main barrier is that small scale producers in Sweden, but more importantly, globally are excluded from certification due to high costs and, and technical constraints. So can we use more models where consumers link up close, more closely with producers, including fishers? Uh, and what are the sustainability implications of that? Thank you for having me here today. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Marlene. Very interesting. Um, uh, picking up on a few things that you said, for instance, the fact that we here, using Sweden as an example, we eat a lot of salmon. I mean, you stress this, and also Sarah said this. Uh, um, that's produced, you know, in a very sort of not really resilient system and etc. And it's one species and all that. When, but when we talk about seafood, we talk about it in a very sort of general manner. Is it a problem that policy talk, you know, in different policy processes that I mentioned? We talk about seafood as one concept. How do we deal with this? What would you like to see to sort of step into having, you know, that kind of variety that you both stressed? Yeah, I think it's, it's really important. I mean, seafood is it's much, much more diverse than any other animal or animal uh, sector, I would say. We have, we farm and fish around 3,000 3, species globally. So it's huge. It's, it's a huge variety, even though, of course, at industrial scale, it's, it's much less. But still, uh, there is definitely a need to think about what is nutritional, uh, sensitive aquaculture and fisheries. How can we zoom in on species with a low environmental impact and high nutritional benefits? And we are globally now in a stage where the aquaculture sector continues to be one of the fastest growing food production se sectors globally, probably the fastest growing. So how can we ensure that we use that window of opportunity to actually expand and develop systems and species with a low impact and that benefits people the most? One global example uh, to illustrate is um, uh, farming, fish farming in, in Bangladesh, where farming of an indigenous small species can provide five times more the amount of vitamin B12 that is very essential for undernourished populations in comparison to farm tilapia, for instance, that have a relatively low nutritional uh, value. So it can make a huge difference. So that's really important. And also finally to integrate uh, blue foods or seafood more into general food policy discussions. So not to treat it as a siloed type of production system, but treat it in, in the food policy discussions as a whole. And seafood is so closely related also to terrestrial systems, primarily when it comes to aquaculture and use of terrestrial feeds, but also for capture fisheries being impacted by, by agriculture on land. Uh, and also that some fish that is caught in the, in the ocean is used for animal feed on yeah, land. Exactly. Back to the feed issue. Uh, could we have maybe just uh, Sara and Marlene sort of same size on the Zoom so we can see both of you? That's great. 
and uh, great thanks so Sarah would you agree with this regarding sort of the problems with focusing in policy issues on coarsely discussing seafood because you also stress the diversity aspects of seafood Yes, but I, I was thinking of how to do it differently. That is not easy either. <laughs> so because talking about 3000 species then, so it's, uh, um, I think uh, looking at both consumption and production is, is crucial. And we often talk within the Seawind project about this exports of, imp uh, of uh, impacts or imports of sustainability, <laughs> because we import a lot of the seafood and some fish is actually better managed in other, other waters. We really need to take care of our local resources better in, from a management perspective. And also we import a lot of salmon that dominates our consumption and it's not even allowed to be produced in that way in Sweden. So it's really an export of, of impacts. So really how to, to, um, to work with um, sustainability in a broad sense. And these general patterns that you've stressed now, sort of the dependence on one species, would you say that that's a similar pattern if you look at around the Baltic Sea, for instance, or even with the European countries, this dependence on a few species? Uh, I, I'm not fully aware of actually seafood consumption in all the countries around the Baltic, but I've been looking at Finland for many years because of uh, the, this uh, starting up with uh, carp fishes and how that was really a success story with, with roach and those species that are increasing in some areas due to eutrophication and how to really work with product development and try to diversify. But it takes ch time. Change takes time and traditions are really difficult to, to, uh, to change. So, uh, yeah. But you need to start somewhere. And I think we can inspire each other and uh, learn from each other's experiences around the Baltic. Marlene, would you agree? Yes, definitely. And I think the food industry and food companies can play a very important role in terms of investing in product development and advertisement for, for new species. Just think about salmon. That was like the, the Norwegian salmon production has really exploded in the last decades. And Salmon was was rare on our tables and even more so in East Asia, where it's now consumed regularly. So, uh, of course, it's, it's tricky to change consumption patterns, but it's definitely not impossible. And I mean, we have I mean, Swedish uh, Swedish like dietary preferences are also very global. I mean, we eat things from all over the world. And I would also say that we are more adaptable than we think. So we, we, I think we we need to be flexible as well if we are to transform our food production systems and consumption habits in the way that we need to do in order for us to uh, to live up to to the SDGs and the Paris, Paris Agreement, for instance. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah. necessary and it's possible, I would say. But the industry and the private sector needs to step up and and explore together with with other actors in society. Okay. Uh, May I add to that? Because I really think that this with the consumers here, that some species are really difficult to uh, avoid, to, to stop eat, say eel. <laughs> That's really, really difficult. And others were really easy to just, uh, well, we found other species, such as carp fishes was actually consumed to a larger extent, up to say 50s, 60s, uh, but was just dropped. And now it's really about getting the interest back again. So what really are the motivating factors for different species? And yeah, groups. and let's hope we stop eating eel, right? Because it's a really endangered <laughs> yeah. species. Yeah, um, but it's really, it's been really difficult. Yes, yeah, difficult. So why, why is that? Why is that? That's a good question. Yeah. We can take that for a whole Baltic breakfast, I think. Why is that possible? <laughs> that possible? Uh, a few questions that touches upon what we're talking about here. Um, is there really enough sort of sustainable seafood available for the global production population? if we are to shift our diets in that direction? Or will we end up in the same problem that we sort of, we know that the seas are outfished, etc. Are we promoting it too much? The, the million dollar question is what is sustainable? <laughs> uh, because we can focus on the targeted stocks and uh, that need to be improvement in how, how they are managed and then have all the other ecosystem impacts such as bycatch and seafloor interactions. And, um, I guess uh, we're, we're still learning how to do this, but it, it, it's crucial that we have these discussions and that actually fishery management is on board because sometimes I tend to see that it, uh, it's not, 
the decisions that are taken are not always promoting the best practice. Uh, mm. If you could uh, choose a gear that it's less impactful than another one, uh, there is another decision taken. Why is that? Why not promote the best available technology to produce with minimized pressures, uh, sustainable so seafood So is, is it problematic that we are pushing seafood now more than when maybe we should be pushing plant-based foods? Or is that, that really really smarter? <laughs> so, what, what do you say, Molly? I think for, for say, well-nourished populations, including the Swedish one, I, I personally believe it is more important to shift to more plant-based diets, also because we already eat quite a lot of seafood in comparison to what we eat globally. But it's a tricky balance, also given that many seafoods have lower impacts than terrestrial and the terrestrial meats. So I, I guess it boils down to the question of what type of, of seafood we put on our plate. If we put the really low impact seafoods, if we put filter feeders, um, maybe algae to a higher extent, while that may not be as replaceable by, by, by terrestrial meats, and also under underutilized species and, and use the, the full uh, the full fish better. I think I think we can probably still promote it, but it's a really good question. And I think for from a Swedish perspective, I think it is more important to to stress the shift to to plant based. But it also, I mean, thinking about how much blue food or seafood do we have available globally, and will it be enough? So that's that we don't know because it depends on how how aquaculture uh, will expand and what we will feed the aquaculture animals that we farm with. So if we, yeah. for instance, really um, rapidly develop algae-based feeds, my microbe-based feeds and, and innovative feeds and also more sustainable extensive systems, I think it could be enough. But it's a really good question. I think it's a question mark for, for the well-nourished parts of the world. But in other parts of the world, seafood can really, really improve the nutritional status of people and can be a much better alternative from an environmental perspective mm. than red meat. So, of course, we would like, as you said, Marlin, for people to choose certified products, you know, because that's sort of a step in the right direction. But what about certification? If you look at the Baltic situation, the Baltic herring is certified mm. in the MSC. But we know that a lot of the situation is really harsh for for the herrings. So mm. can we trust certification? There's a question of that here. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think that a particular example is, of course, a question mark, given that it's I mean, the, the herring fishery can also impact the ecosystem as a whole. And I think but I think we have to look at and think about certification with the, the expression of don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. I think we will always have cases where certification where um, non-sustainable um, fisheries or aquaculture systems have been certified, but maybe they shouldn't. And I think it's important to support certification programs and schemes at the same time as we have a critical dialogue with them. And um, so I think for the consumer side, the consumer who is going to the grocery store with a hungry two-year-old uh, and, and tries to, to to pick the best alternative, I still think that picking the certified seafood is the best choice. So, far, so I would yeah. support that from a consumer perspective. But NGOs and, and academia should definitely uh, push the certification and standard holders to improve. Yeah. Um, Sora, we have a question here regarding really animal welfare in aquaculture. Is there such science? Can we say something about this? It's a I must start with it's not my topic, no, uh, I know, but, but I know it's it's uh, the attention has been increasing towards this uh, field of research, and it's really about starting with do fish feel pain? It's really about you know it's started with pigs and they even babies a uh, long time ago. It's really you you advance the the knowledge of how of animal welfare, and I haven't followed that uh, research development at all, but it is an, it's starting to become an issue to consumers, and I guess industry need to pay attention to it before it becomes something that you don't yeah <laughs> to, i mean don't slaughtering situations stressed yes. without the cages yeah. that's but, been discussed but you you think about if a big say herring fishery coming up with tons of fish uh, and if they would scream like pigs and it's really how fish are really different compared to what we are accustomed mm. to and mm. how how should animal welfare in fisheries uh, you can't really kill each 
each fish mm. <laughs> fish in, in, in an animal welfare way. So it's, it's difficult, it's challenging. Yeah. Probably an increase in field of discussion, of course. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that would be a topic for <laughs> another field. Yes. Right. Yeah. Um, well, I would like to get back to feed before we finish up. The time is almost running out. We've talked so so far a lot about seafood for human consumption, but we all know that most of the fish is going to feed, especially in the Baltic Sea. Um, and feed is less discussed, really. I mean, can we really go on with this if we're going to feed the population also with seafood? You mean go on with, with feed feeding production or... fish with other fish, you know, <laughs> in the aquaculture system? Hmm. Well, the development has been towards yes, uh, yes. diluting this towards more hmm. and more land-based uh, uh, systems. And uh, adding to Malin's comment uh, earlier on uh, how much we can sustainably produce, if we take out the chunk of the feed that is directed toward uh, beef and animal, uh, land-based animals and directed towards aquaculture, uh, that could actually increase uh, aquaculture. Um, but still, it's a feed, it's a competition of food. We could eat the soy directly. Uh, yes, but... exactly. Yes. So time is running up always. I would like to finalize with one question, you know, getting us back to policy. And we've touched upon it, but if you can choose and have a have a wish list now, you know, you are directly linked to the policymakers. They will do what you say tomorrow. And what would you like them to do? It's in, in fisheries management, it's really to minimize pressures and optimize the societal value of the output of that system. It's really to take to think about really okay. uh, how so that's by decisions law are taken. And regulation or is it by taxes or is it by getting rid of it's, it's, it's allocations or? of quotas okay, and quotas. elimination right. of subsidies, fossil fuel subsidies, of course. That fossil would... fuel subsidies, yes. Thank you. Uh, Marlene. Yeah, so if, if the question is to how, what should the politicians do, I think first think about uh, blue food production as part of food production in total in the Swedish food system. Think about how you could help steer consumption away from the more impactful red meat to potentially more seafood, but also through uh, official like school meals, for instance. How could you, how could you, um, help young people to uh, to change their dietary preferences through maybe serving other types of seafood already at daycares and in schools to help shift and diversify seafood consumption towards sustainability in the future. Thank you. So it's really a broad spectrum of policy issues that we need to be, you know, policymakers acting on right now. Thanks a lot, Sara, Marlene, for this interesting talk. And thanks all to you who are listening. There are more questions, but we will try to answer them on our web. And we will be back in August. It's all on the 26th of August. And then we will talk about the coast ecosystems in relation to climate change. So please come back and join us then. And until then, have a really nice summer. Goodbye. <laughs>